In 2013, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and IGRO, SDSU Extension, for delivering the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. A series of two local events were held in South Dakota, in Lemon and Fort Pier. Yeah, well, thank you. And, uh, on the program, it says, Sistons Approach to No-Till. I don't put the word No-Till in my title slide, to be truthful. No-till's a tool. My first word up there is residue. It's residue is going to make that system work. Now, granted, I do a lot of work in Nebraska, a lot of work on a research farm where I have those long-term plots about 10 miles east of Lincoln. So a little ways south of you guys. But I do a lot of traveling around the countryside. In fact, I even slipped a few uh, South Dakota slides in this presentation. But again, when it comes to residue, uh, that's the key. Protect that soil. Keep the sun and wind off of it. Absorb energy, raindrop impact. Uh, cycle those nutrients of the residue into your next crop. Uh, one of the things I hate most is the guys who think they got to get rid of the residue or get rid of the protection for that soil. Uniformity. I like uniformity every day of the year when I look at my fields. You know, a lot of people think about a uniform picket fence stand on planting, for instance, or uniform uh, pesticide application. No, I like uniformity every day. Uh, right now, it's uniform snow cover, perhaps. But again, systems approach because in no-till, every step affects the next. Now, it could be in the olden days with tillage, you know, if you screwed up a little bit on the tillage, you just well, did another pass. If you screwed up herbicide application, you just did another uh, herbicide application or another cultivation or another tillage pass or whatever. If you start thinking ahead, then you're more careful on each step. And so, again, we start thinking about it. Tillage has never built soil structure. Tillage always destroys soil structure. It destroys soil-biological life. Uh, I started comparing different tillage systems years ago and uh, figure it out real fast. And again, Mother Nature never does tillage. Uh, farmers have gotten a lot better. There are even some residue out there to reduce tillage. And the 85 Farm Bill you know, made people start thinking about that, for some for erosion control. They weren't thinking about soil biological life, though. We've got to think about that as well. And again, uh, I've given talks before on compaction. And again, tillage causes compaction because it destroys soil structure such that there's nothing there to support you. Uh, I mentioned this, the raindrop compaction this morning. Uh, again, residue out there, just take care of that. Living roots, take care of that. Again, compaction is not an issue when you get in long-term established no-till. And driving on or tilling the wet soil is the main problem with compaction, but even when it comes to soil biological life, soil structure, any tillage is bad. Now, a lot of people ask me about uh, vertical tillage, and I'm only going this deep. No, that's exactly the layer you don't want to disturb. That's the layer that all the biological activity is going on. Uh, this one I do have to show you, though. I said tillage has never built soil structure. In this case, it has. This is an organic producer. The ground surface is just about where the screen's being mounted here. And this is an organic wheat producer in western Nebraska. Wheat fallow rotation. After harvest, through the fallow year, onto the next year, so roughly 14 months, he has anything from 15 to 20 tillage trips since he's organic. He does that to control his weeds. He has built soil structure. He's beat every pore of that soil. He's built something we call massive soil structure. Again, tillage is not good. These layers down here were interesting. That's where we're adding sweeps or blades at different depths. You could actually pull those layers out and see the smears on there. Again, below this, though, beautiful soil structure. Free soil, wetting and drying. But if you can't get water and roots down through this, it doesn't matter what's down here. I hate people who come along and erase that where it goes all the way to the soil surface. Now, wheat fallow rotation, organic wheat, this is what his wheat look like. Again, when it comes to soil biological life, do you see any? Does my footprint there look that much different than this one? <laughs> we know there's no life there. I think it's pretty close to no life there as well. Again, that same area, the native soil structure. You know, there's roots down there putting carbon from the carbon dioxide down into the soil. Mother Nature did that with the living root and that soil profile maybe where you're at 10, 12 months a year. Now, it may not have been actively growing, but it was there. We come along doing crop production, we got that living root there maybe only five months a year. Again, that's where it covers uh, perennials and the rotations, whatever. Let's get those living roots back into the soil system. And again, build stable aggregates. This is uh, about 10 years plus no-till. Just walked across the fence. This is a conventional till. So again, we got to build that. So again, that's just sort of reinforce some of the things we heard from speakers this morning. Stop talking about my, some of my experiences then. 
1981, I started, uh, actually in 78, I started working with no-till. 1981, I had a little three-year grant, and I did tillage comparisons. And this slide is taken, oh, about 20 years after that. Those plots are still going. When that grant ended, I thought, well, I'm going to have to plow up the no-till. It's never going to work. In about three years, it took me to figure out how to no-till. Think back to 1981. We didn't have the herbicides or the equipment we have today. It's a lot easier today. But again, here's uh, soybeans planted in the grain sorghum residue that year. There's some beans under a crust. There's some beans laying in dry soil. some beans that are never going to grow. On the no-till side, virtually every bean is up and growing. I love no-till. I love uh, that time. We didn't have Roundup ready crops. Roundup was $100 a gallon. I learned to no-till without Roundup. We put down our early pre-plant herbicide, rained in and activated. We have weed-free environments when we plant. I like that. Now with Roundup resistance, that's making a comeback for residual herbicides. Uh, I've got a separate hour-long presentation on water savings and no-till. But again, by parking the tillage, we save water. Reducing evaporation of the mulch out there, we save water. Better infiltration, we save water. I have a question mark here because in my presentation, I've got a six-inch rain that happened overnight. But again, we start looking at water savings. That's what I want to put to use. And when it comes to putting it to use, 2000 was a year that we only had uh, 13 inches of rainfall during the entire year. A lot of our neighbors are harvesting 25 bushel beans felt pretty good at that little rain until they heard my no-till went 47. Grain sorghum that year to the line again, till versus the no-till. Again, using that water. I love the no-till system. 2000. Uh, eight or nine, somewhere in there, uh, I had phone calls from farmers say, boy, my no-till doesn't look good compared to tilled. And I says, why is that? Well, it was a cool wet spring. I went out there and started looking, and there's to the line. I go like, they don't look that bad. And again, we start thinking about it. In the early days of no-till, when you don't have the soil biological life, you don't have the soil structure, you don't have the aggregates there, it could be a minor problem. The quicker you get that healthy soil system, the problem goes away. Now, it was interesting, though, as I walked out here, and I face the no-till side, snap that picture. Looks fairly uniform. Remember, I said I like uniformity every day of the year. You may look at that. This is uh, after 28 years of continuous no-till. See how little residue I've got? It's a corn bean rotation at this time. I've got so much biology activity, my residue is disappearing too fast. And again, when a producer calls me and says, how do I deal with this residue? I know they don't have soil biology activity. Get that going. Your residue cycles for you. Now, that's the no-till side. Turn to the tilled side. Not near as uniform. It was planted the same day. That uniformity, or lack of uniformity in this case, costs you on yield. Uniformity every day of the year. 2009, good rainfall year to the line. No-till, tilled. Look at standability. Again, the tillage destroys soil structure, the root system there. You get a heavy rain, wet soil, wind blows. Standability issues has gone away for us as well when we go to the no-till. We plant deeper, better root system. 2015, so this is now 35 years of tillage versus, tillage down here versus no-till. This is dry land production, 10 miles east of Lincoln. I like the no-till. Oops, I should mention one thing here. Uh, 2007, I used to have no-till with crop cultivation. I changed that to no-till with cover crop. I used to have two diskings versus one disking. I changed that to two diskings with the cover crop. And I did that because I don't have enough residue out there. I'm trying to grow some more residue. Now, there's a lot of producers that look at this and say, well, look how much yield you gave up having the cover crop out there. I say, look how much yield you gave up by doing tillage. <laughs> I'm still ahead of the tillage, and I'm growing a healthier soil there. Now, again, when it comes to tillage, you know, a lot of people think no-till is park this, just plant. No, it's systems approach. Harvest, for instance, uniform height of residue, uniform spread of residue, uniformity every day of the year. Now, here's one of our fields already planted. Where did the combine run the year before harvesting those soybeans? If you can see that in your fields, you've got a problem. We want a uniform cover of residue everywhere. It's found a corn bean rotation there. Now, a lot of people ask me, don't you run residue movers? I go, why? Right now, every seed is under the same residue cover in the same soil moisture and the same soil temperature. It's going to give you your most uniform stands your best yields. I hate residue disturbance. Also, our herbicides already rained in and activated. I hate Roundup Ready corn because I like Roundup Ready beans. But in our corn herbicide, we put down a broadleaf and a grass control early, made some 2,4-D for the emerged winter annuals. 
come back and post-emerge two different modes of action, perhaps. On our beans, we put down a grass control early. We use Roundup. Across the corn bean rotation, I got seven different modes of action. I'm not worried about weed resistance either. Again, systems approach. Start thinking about things like that, how it all fits together. Again, I the combine around the year before. You know, a lot of people don't think too much of that little pile of residue back there in the axle of the combine. I don't think too much of it either when it plugs up the drill, the fertilizer rig, the planter, or whatever. This was on a drilling where we had problems with residue distribution. Taking the extra 10 minutes to set the combine, this problem goes away. Again, systems approach, each step affects the next. You know, on a platform head, you need to have chaff distribution. Choppers, in the early days of no-till, you'll love them because the residue is broken up and break down fast. The longer you're no-till, you're going to hate them because it opens up the residue and breaks down fast. We got rid of choppers years ago. Chaff spreaders are a must because right now I've got a windrow of pods here. Less here, we got another windrow of pods. Next spring, that's two different soil temperatures, two different soil moistures. Put chaff distribution on platform heads. And again, here's an example. Producer called me and says, I got trouble with my wheat stand. Before I even got there, he says, I already figured it out. He said, the wrong combine harvested the soybeans. I said, what wrong combine? He says, we've got two, one with chaff spreader, one without. And again, you can tell where his pod windrow was on this 30-foot head out there. Here's one that went the other way. This is a little six-row combine. When it harvested the soybeans before and implanted the grain sorghum here, the good grain sorghum is where the chaff windrow was because he's got extra moisture there, cooler soil there. And so again, uniform residues residue distribution, I want that out there in the field. You know, too many people just think about the harvest. No, spend the money, get that stuff spread out. Now, if you're going to harvest that residue off, maybe windrows is great. But even if you're going to do tillage here, there aren't too many tillage that can handle a windrow like that. And the ones that really bother me are these guys. Convert it to income. I will sell my corn residue in large round bales at $250 a ton. I don't know anybody who'll pay that, because that's about what I'm giving up per acre when I bail off the residue. <laughs> Leave the residue out there. Just every one of these 1,000 pound corn bales is a $20 bill when it comes to nutrient value alone. And I know guys selling them for $20 a ton to the feedlots. They're already losing double already. But when you think about what's going on out there, I can go to the co-op, buy the NPKS, makes those $20 up, but I can't buy the carbon that I'm losing. There's a lot of carbon going away there. You know, if you need the livestock feed, they got legs, bring them out there because, as I heard this morning, about 80% of it stays behind as far as the nutrients. Now, this one needs a few cross fences. You greatly improve manure distribution if the cattle are more concentrated and moving more often. Again, when you're on nutrient distribution, uniformity every day of the year, cross fences helps reduce this problem. But again, when it comes to the carbon removal, you know, a lot of people say, I got plenty of residue out there. You know, the NRCS, years ago, in the 85 Farm Bill, they said if I leave half the residue out there, I'm going to cut erosion in half. Or leave 30% cover, I'm sorry. 30% cover cuts erosion in half. I got more than 30% cover there. That's all I need for water conservation, right? Not quite. Norm Clocky down at Garden State, or Garden City, Kansas, was doing work on evaporation from the soil surface bare eight hundredths inch per day. Now, let's just for quick math, say I'm growing 100 day corn. That's eight inches lost to evaporation off of bare soil. Leaving some cover there, wait a minute, 75% cover is only 700, so that's uh, 100 days, that's one inch water saved. It didn't cut it in half, did it? 100% cover is down here, that's three inches of water saved in the growing season just by leaving the cover out there. And again, when it comes to selling residue, that's yield you just gave up if you lost three inches of water. I asked Norm about that. I says, wait a minute, 30% cover cuts erosion in half. What happens here? He says, build the best house you can. R19 insulation in the walls, R38 insulation in the ceiling, triple pane windows. And when the kids go out the door, they leave the door open, all the heat gets out. Water, vapor, and soil does the same thing, preferential flow. You need 100% cover. But too often I see people who bail up their wheat straw, they let weeds grow. Some people say, oh, this is the poor man's cover crop. Well, not quite. It's not very uniform. But any time i got bare soil exposed to the sun, i got problems. Now, what's interesting, though, a lot of people think those weeds are using water. When you go out there with soil moisture probe, there's probably less water here than there is underneath that weed. It's because the sun and wind are kept off that soil surface. 
That's where I want a cover crop. The cover crop, I manage it. I don't let it go to seed. Also, it's managed because it's uniform stand out there. But again, we got to treat our wheat stubbles. Well, I used to think that. I plant the cover crop now. If I got a cover crop growing there, my wheat stubble doesn't need treating. In fact, I don't spray for volunteer wheat anymore because my cover crop gets seeded immediately after wheat harvest. That takes care of volunteer wheat for me as well. Because my seed's in the ground, the volunteer wheat seed is on top of the ground. That's the ones the mice and bugs eat. My cover crop grows. Again, chaff distribution is important. Straw distribution is important. Uh, this one, you know, you don't see any windrows out there. That's what I want to see. Again, if you're doing a double crop or a cover crop, get that out there seeded right away. Now, a lot of guys doing the double crop and cover crop, they'll say, I want a chopper out there because I don't want long pieces of straw out there. No, we leave ours unchopped, leave it as long as possible. But again, here's the double crop right as the combine is leaving the field or seeding right away. But again, that standing residue, uh, Nielsen out of Akron, two extra inches of water in the non-growing season. That reduced evaporation Norm was talking about was during the growing season. Take those three inches there and two more here if your soil can store it, that's more water. Residues out there making it work. And again, the taller residues, a lot of guys go into the stripper header. Leave that residue taller yet. Leave it where it's attached and you don't have to spread it. Here's over here at Martin, South Dakota, uh, Ireland's planter. Minimal soil disturbance. Out there planting the day I visited him, he was planting sunflowers in stripper head harvested wheat stubble. Now, some people don't like the stripper head harvested stuff when it wet snow comes with a little bit of wind because it all goes flat. Others love it because that's 100% cover out there. So again, manage the system. Now when you have a long piece of straw out there, that's when you gotta get rid of residue movers that turn and twist because a lot of times they'll just wrap up residue. Especially when you start going into some tall cover crops. You wanna get rid of the residue movers as well. And again, here's Mark Watson out of Alliance, Nebraska. Strip headed harvested wheat stubble. Plant right through it, no residue movers. Our combine, we run a silver cedar. We don't run a chopper on the back. It's a small farm, uh, we've got terraces, only 15 feet wide. Silver cedar, some of you need. <laughs> All right. Again, we don't run the chopper. We leave the straw as long as possible. By next spring, that straw's gone. But we leave as, our residue as tall as we can because it's not touching soil microbes. Now, a lot of people say, I'm gonna cut down short, get all the contact with the soil, if you got soil biological life, that residue will disappear. If you don't have soil biological life, you're gonna have a mat of residue you can't get through next year. Cut it tall. Leave residue as tall as possible. Anything that's standing upright is anchored and attached, soil will be holding it so your equipment can pass through it. If it's standing upright, you don't have to cut it. If corn harvest, we don't need the chaff spreader. We're all lazy though, we don't take it off. Uh, this is a producer I worked with. Um, this is uh, the year I took this picture. He had a seven pivot average of 265 corn. On the slopes, he needs the no-till for erosion control. If you're looking close, those are 18 20 inch rows going through that big cat, roughly 265 corn, and that's all the stuff's coming out the back. The corn head processes your residue for you if your corn head's working properly. Worst thing you can do is put a corn reel on and push all that stalks and ears and leaves well, you want the ears to go in, but you don't need the rest of the stuff going through the combine. Corn head should process it for you. Again, uniform height, processed. The cat combine has a knife to knife snap and roll design on there. A lot of people say, well, I can process the residue with a separate trip. Or I can buy a shredder, it goes on the bottom of the corn head. No, that takes money, it takes horsepower. I don't like those. I hate cutting residue loose. It's gonna blow in the wind. It's gonna move with flowing water. Again, it's a wasted operation in my book. Now here's the field, day after combining. Who'd be afraid of no-tilling into that one? One's honest over here. Chains on your meters, good idea. This is harvest of the six-row combine. What if you had a 12-row planter? You start planting and these first six rows are leaning in the same direction the planters going, the next six rows are coming right back at you. Every hose, wire, cable, chain just got caught and snagged near a cuss no-till. Systems approach would tell me if my combine is half as wide as my planter, you combine two paths the same direction, two paths the same direction, plant the same direction, the stocks are leaning. Little things add up when you start thinking about it. This is actually a combine with intermeshing snapping rolls. As such, when one flute hits, the stock leans this way, another one hits, 
leans this way. You get some ear toss out the side of the combine head, so you run the combine head up high. And this stock has never gone through the snapping rolls. There's nothing there to process it. Now, if you want it to hang around for a while, that's great. I love that. Now, some guys will say, well, I'll spray some liquid nitrogen on there, feed the microbes to break that residue down. How many soil microbes do you see up here? Don't spray nitrogen on there to feed the microbes unless the microbes are there. That means the residue is touching the soil. And if you've got a good balanced system, they don't need the extra food. So again, think little things adding up. Uh, here's the intermeshing snapping rolls. Right behind the intake screw, worn right there. Stripper plates, worn right there. That's why those stalks are leaning. You're physically just combing the ears off those stalks. Uh, John Deere had the intermeshing snapping rolls for years. They've changed their snapping roll design in the new corn heads. They actually, in their old corn heads, they had tapered snapping rolls. I love the tapered snapping rolls. The stock gets through there, goes on up, where it's distributed. A lot easier to no-till behind that. So again, here's a farmer I met in Kansas. He says, you know, put a lean bar out front. Lean the stocks over to protect all those hoses, wires, cables, chains. He added some extra weight. He's got his fertilizer. He's doing everything in one pass. Some guys love the one pass system. I know Dwayne's a huge fan of the one pass system. And it's because if you got a wide crop rotation, one pass makes sense. We got some guys in Nebraska, the irrigation do only corn. How many days you got to plant corn before you lose yield? 20, 30 days? How many weeks do you have that you can be putting on your fertilizer? 20 or 30 weeks. Why would you slow the planter down? Now, if I got a wide crop rotation, I'm doing some early spring crops, some corn, beans, all the way to fall crops. Now it could be that I got this planter is busy now doing everything because I can't come back to that field later to put on that fertilizer. Again, when you start thinking systems approach, one pass might be great for labor savings, but is it true timing to get everything done properly? Again, I love the one pass system if you've got a lot of crop rotation, crop variety. I know I can put it. Forgy over here. They like the one pass, but he's got, I don't know, latest count, what, 10 different crops growing out there? Again, here's an air seeder. This guy even filled his full of concrete just to make sure he leans the stalks over. He's planting into sunflower stalks. Here's a modern Richter's drill. Again, lean bar out front, lean those stalks over. Just little things start to add up. Here's one of our fields. This is when we used to run knife to knife snap and rolls on a red combine. And we had, uh, that's the day after combine, about 200 bushel corn. The previous one was 90 bushel corn. This one was too much processing once our no-till system got established. When I say too much processing, well, the knife to knife snap and roll does not cut the stock off. It just runs that close together. And as it rotates, that opens up so the stock basically goes straight down, crushed, scored. Here's what our fields look like. There's, again, 200 bushel corn residue the next spring with our soil biologic activity. We got rid of the knife to knife snap and rolls because it was processing residue too much. We got rid of that combine and went to our silver cedar tapered snap and rolls. Run the corn head a lot higher, let that residue hang around till next spring because we don't want to process the residue. And again, if you're in first year no-till, you're going to love processing residue. If you're in long-term no-till and you have biological activity, stop processing the residue. And again, this is about 200, 220 bushel corn. Look how little res residue is coming out of the back of the combine. Corn head is processing the stalks. Again, uniformity every day of the year. We got snow cover right now. We like tall stalks to catch the snow. Uniform cover. We like the tall stalks. That's not corn stalks there. That's grain sorghum. There's 24 inches of snow out there. That's extra water for us and a uniform snow cover. Too often I see things like this. You know, here's till on this side versus no till here. That's a little more uniform. But over here he says, well, I want the snow to blow off so it warms up. Well, yeah, that will warm up. It'll dry out. But you know what? It also freezes harder because there's no insulated blanket there. We got a weather station on our research farm 10 miles east of Lincoln. Our ground is not frozen yet to two inches. We've had a nighttime low this last week with seven degrees below. We're not froze yet because we've got an insulated blanket on top, residue, and a living root, cool season cover, soil biology going on. We'll go through some winters we don't even freeze two to four inches for much more than about a week. People worry about cold, wet soils in the spring. Not ours. But again, think about this over here. It's going to freeze harder. And in the spring, yes, it's going to warm up and dry out. But where the drift is, it's going to stay cold and wet. So much for uniformity. Taller residue out there. 
Again, tile spade full of soil from our long-term tillage plots. This is from no-till. A piece caved off here. This is from the till. There's some research coming out of France that's saying in no-till, the soil temperature in the spring are actually warmer because heat can rise from below. On the till, it can't come up through this layer. We see the same thing. We can plant our no-till sooner than our tilled neighbors can plant their fields. Our goal is to have all of our corn, beans, and milo planted by May 1. When even our own university researchers say you can't plant soybeans until May 5th because the soil is not warm enough in tilled soils. Ours are already up and growing. But again, think about soil structure. I failed to point it out on mine. I showed the till versus no till. If you may have noticed the tilled side was lower elevation. Tillage beat down the soil structure. K State plots, same thing. The tilled plots are shorter than the no till plots. Tillage beats down the soil structure. I get better soil structure, more a poor space there to store water, more space for air exchange. But I got a lot of farmers who tell me, well, I no till. In Nebraska, we no till the corn and the bean residue. To make no till work, you need continuous no till. You know, they don't have residue here, don't have soil structure here. Yes, he planted without tillage. He saved the tillage dollars that year, but as far as the soil is concerned, it's still a tilled soil. You go further east, you go to Ohio, 95% of their soybeans are no tilled. They till before they plant their corn. No, you had till nothing. Every crop has to be no-tilled to make it work and diversity in there and rotation. Now, and again, in that first year, when you don't have soil life. You got a little bit of crust there. You got something there. There's a lot of companies out there want to sell you something. Airway here, there's Phillips Heralds, Phoenix Heralds. There's all sorts of vertical tillage tools. And they'll say you go out there and you fluff that layer of residue, fluff that top layer of soil such that it'll warm up and dry out. Here's a fall demonstration. You just created a mat here, you're going to have problems next spring. The guys who run the fluffing heralds, as they're called, will run it half day in front of the planter on a soil that has no structure, no soil biological life. It might be a transition tool. To me, it's still full with tillage. It's not a no-till tool. Ridge tail for irrigation. There's a company in Nebraska that's pushing this thing, pulls the heart of the root stump out. They actually brought it up from Texas, from uh, cotton country, pulling out stumps for bow weevil control. And he says, the planter run a lot smoother. We found out every place we ran it, planting on top of these ridges, we lost five to seven bushels per acre. Because we've got areas without residue, we've got areas with extra residue, we've got some big holes there where the root balls pulled out, we've got non-uniform stand compared to where we no-till on top of the ridge. Everything's more uniform. Wasted trip. Here's one of the fields we did. We got water backed up on us. Didn't need the plot map. You can tell where we pulled it loose. Again, I hate cutting residue loose. Leave it anchored, attached. Here's a producer who had high level, high yielding corn. He went out and rented a vertical tillage tool. Called me in the spring and says, what do I do? And I looked at that and I go, what did you do? <laughs> he cut all his residue loose. The deepest drift we found was about a foot deep. Now, how wet is it there versus there? Again, non-uniformity. I hate cutting residue loose. Deanne Presley, K-State's done some work on these vertical tillage tools. She's found that one pass of the vertical tillage tool, disturbing that layer that I said you don't want to disturb, cuts infiltration in half and doubles the runoff. Don't do it. Now, after saying that, I run vertical tillage. People, when I ask them, why do you run a vertical tillage tool, they'll say, it cuts and sizes the residue. I says, so is my drill. It takes the residue and puts it in contact with the soil microbes. I said, so does my drill. My drill puts the seed in the ground at the same time to feed the soil biology. Here's about 220 bushel corn as I do the day after harvest. That's when I seed my cover crops. There's March 15th, the next spring. Where's all that corn residue? My vertical tillage tool took care of it with the soil biology, with the living root, with Austin winter peas there fixing nitrogen for me. Now, March 15th, by the time we're ready to plant corn, it can fix 100 pounds in in a nice warm spring. I've had cool springs that at corn planting time, the Austrian winter peas are this big and didn't fix any in. You can't always plan on that, it depends upon the weather. Now, some people say, I gotta till it to get rid of the corn stalks. My long-term tillage plots, this picture was taken in 2014, so this is 34 years of no-till versus 34 years, this side is fall chiseled. This side is no-till for 34 years with the last seven being with cover crop. 
You see any difference in soil biology breaking down residue? Again, tillage doesn't get rid of residue if you don't have soil biology there to digest it. Maria Casa of Iowa State just came out with a paper saying that he looked at BT versus non-BT, looked at tillage versus no tillage, looked at several different things, found out it's the soil biology that breaks down your residue, not the tillage. I love the cover crops. I plant them the day after harvest. Get them up and growing right away. That drill I showed you earlier left my corn stalk stand. Drill leaves my wheat stubble stand. That's already drilled to a cover crop. Looks like that when it's coming up. Now, all of our wheat ground gets cover crop that's got at least two cool season grasses, two warm season grasses, two cool season broad, uh, legumes, two warm season legumes, and then some extra things. We always end up with about 12 things in there. Got uh, buckwheat in there for pollinators. But again, the cover crops are really paying for us in that wheat stubble to build soil biological life. And again, here is a corn bean wheat rotation. After the corn harvest, this is just simply cereal rye by itself. This is no cover crop. See the difference in soil biology? That project's now, this is about the 10th year on it in the corn bean wheat rotation. Doing cereal rye or Austin winter peas after the corn harvest, planting beans the next year. Wheat goes in immediately after the beans, so there's no room for a cover crop. In the wheat stubble, I go either bin run milo or bin run soybeans. What I'm doing is comparing carbon cover crops to legume cover crops. Again, just different research projects. I like leaving the stalks as tall as possible. You know, they're rubbing on the axle of the tractor and on the planter itself. Here's a couple of visitors from the United Kingdom. Couldn't believe we were planting the stuff that tall. I had to snap pictures. I had to snap picture of them snapping pictures. But again, air gets down to the soil surface because my residue is standing up. If you create a mat of residue, then you're in trouble. Now, I let the planter knock the stalks over. Because for me, in Nebraska, raindrop impact those spring rains. I want some flattened residue after planting. This is actually planting soybeans here. I always plant on the rows. I'll talk more about that. Now, I have those long-term tillage plots. I went out there the day I was going to do my spring disking on the till plots. I walked up to a corn stalk, grabbed hold of the stalk, and pulled. Went over the no-till, grabbed hold of one, and pulled. Hold them up, snap the picture. Which one's which? That's the tilled. There's no biology activity there to ride off the root balls. This is the no-till. This yields 10, 20 bushel better than that every year. The biology activity is there riding off the roots. And I say it because when I plant down the old row, I don't roll out any root balls. My long-term no-till has the biology activity. Now, first year in, you don't have the biology activity. Plant beside the old row. And after a few years, then you start planting on the row. I love planting on the row because I didn't drive there last year, so I never planted a wheel track. Here's what it looks like a few weeks later. This is the same field. Now that I put that residue in contact with the soil, that residue is disappearing because now it's touching soil microbes. Again, once you get the soil biology activity, leave the residue standing as long as you can. I want the residue to break down when the next crop is growing so the carbon being released goes into the canopy and the nutrients go back in the soil system. Again, I've worked with farmers across Nebraska. This is in the 80s. The planters we had back then is old 5 by 7 toolbar. Should have pulled one weed, right? But here he is planting. Herbicides already rained in and activated, planting soybeans. And a stand looked like that. Again, that was back in the 80s. We can do it. Now, I want you to plant. This is the way I learned most interesting thing on where do you plant. This farmer is on 36-inch rows for his corn. For his soybeans, he thought he was giving up yield, so he had the blacksmith make a hitch that shifted the planter over five inches. That's why it's so close to this wheel. And people walked here, so you can't quite tell it. But in the background here, you can see sort of two rows of corn. He had his corn planted here. He's got RTK guidance. He planted corn on corn. The next year, he planted over five inches. Then he came in with soybeans. He's going to go down, come back on the exact same path. Since he's offset, he's going to have beans paired row, effectively an 18 inch on the 36. Now, on his pass down, there's standing residue from last year. There's dead root balls from the year before. One row goes straight in those dead root balls. When he comes back, there's a row over here, what I call no man's land. There's no root ball there from a year ago. He said, I have trouble with my stand. 
The good row there is the one that went in the root balls from two years ago where there's some soil biological activity. The poor row is the one that went into the no man's land where there's no soil biological life. If he planted it down the old row where the most biological life is, the stand's even better yet. That's the reason I plant down the old row because of soil biology, like Jay talked about this morning. Now, if you've got drove crops, you get more soil biology everywhere. But if you're only row crops, I learned a lot watching this one. Can he get good seed placement? Oh, yes. That's a whole separate hour-long talk on my planters. Now, a lot of guys say, plant between the rows. You know, that's where I drove last year, so I got some rows now in wheel tracks and some not in wheel tracks. I also drive on the residue, wear out the tractor tires real fast. We never drive on the residue. But again, I don't like planting between the rows. That's the least biologically active area of the field. Corn on corn, we plant right beside the old row. Put narrow depth gauges on your planter, you can get darn close to that old row, because that's where the most soil biology is. We do that. And again, I leave all the residue in place because there are roots right there, if you've got residue. If you take away the residue, there's no roots there. You know, in till soil, there are no roots up here at all. Now, with the mulch there and no-till, I've got moisture, I've got roots, I've got that quick rain that soaks in only a half inch, it gets used. On till soil, that quick inch, half inch rain makes a crust up here because there's no residue, and there's no roots there to take it up anyway. So again, systems approach is build that better root system. That residue keeps that soil surface cooler. Here's my long-term tillage plots a few years ago. Grain sorghum, five days in a row, first week of June, over 100 degrees. Without residue, it didn't die, but it went dormant because the soil was just too hot. With residue, 35 bushel per acre difference. Now, after those five days, it rained. This took off growing, and we thought there's going to be no difference. We were surprised when the combine ran. South Australia visited a producer and said, yeah, I've been no-tilling about 15 years. This is what this field looked like. I was there about a week after it was 120 degrees air temperature. Soil temperatures were reaching about 160 degrees. You cook a steak in the grill, how hot do you cook it so it's safe to eat to kill all the bacteria? 140, 130. His soil's dead, even though he's a no-tiller. He has a shank opener on his air seeder, and he harvests off his wheat straw. This is his wheat straw. That's what his roots look like. This is his neighbor who had a stripper header. Keeps the sun and wind off the soil surface. Which one has soil biological activity? Again, he's a no-tiller, but he has no soil biological activity because he doesn't protect the soil with residue. Residue is what makes it work. And again, stripper head harvested, easy to plant through. Take off the residue movers and go. Ours, platform header. Planting soybeans, April 15th, and again, remember our soybean physiologists say you can't plant soybeans before May 5th because the soils aren't warm enough. We're going no-till into heavy wheat straw. No problem. Once the soil structure is built, excess water drains down, stored, used later in the season. Now, if I got a tillage pan up here and that spring rain sits here and can't soak in, it will be cold and wet. So make a continuous no-till, build soil structure. People ask about residue movers, think uniformity. If this producer, he's in his second year no-till, he just moved over a little bit, planted again, moved over. But what if he decided to plant this direction? He's got cool or warm, dry here, cool, wet, warm, dry, cool, wet. If you put residue movers on to kick all this out, you have a more uniform stand as the yield will go up. I can agree with that because it's more uniform. We found, though, when we were on residue movers, our yields go down because we already had residue everywhere. Planted the corn. The wind blows in Nebraska and some residue blew back. So here's warm, dry, come up quick. Here's cool, wet, it's a little slower. Warm, dry, cool, wet, and this one actually leafed out under the residue. We lose yield when we run residue movers because the wind blows and makes it non-uniform. So again, the more uniform you can get, the better yields you get. And we had a research project going on. All of our high power researchers got together and said, we're going to raise 300 bushel corn in five years. This is their fifth year, irrigated corn on corn planting right beside the old row. And this is actually a portion of the field where it was a 44,000 population on a 44,000 population. Now, that row looks a little stunning because he's on the edge of the wheel track, but it doesn't look too bad there. They never made their 300. The best they did was 267. In the corn bean rotation, they made 289. Rotation better. But again, it can be done. 
Knife to knife snap rolls in the combine process, process the residue. No residue movers on the planter. Just plant. Now, in back of the planter, the residue movers I don't like in back. Keaton Seed Firmer I like for seed to soil contact, but more importantly, I like it for uniform seeding depth or some sort of attachment for that. Crumble the seed V closed versus packing it closed. It depends upon your soil. I'm a fan of the crumbling because this is less likely to open back up if you plant when it's too wet. You may close the seed V perfect the day you're planting, but once the soil dries and it shrinks, it can open back up. The crumbled soil is not going to open back up as much. I always have to pick on Dwayne. He's an agronomist by training. He plays more with equipment. I'm the engineer by training. I play more with the system. A lot of people call that their motor planter. Here's our old motor planter. Uh, this is a foggy morning. A lot of people say you can't handle residue when it's wet. Foggy morning, we're out there planting. You can see some full-length soybean straw out there because we don't run the chopper. It's foggy. It's a planting date study. That was the date I was supposed to plant. It rained an inch and a quarter the day before. We're out planting on a foggy morning. Mineral soil disturbance. Here's the fun picture. Look at the depth gauge wheels on the planter. They never run on soil. They're always running on residue. Uniform seeding depth. I got a key seed firmer hiding underneath there. Yes, I'm picking up a little bit here. I've got crumblers there. Give me some loose soil there. But again, the seed's already placed. Very seldom do we get rained out because we've got good soil structure, we've got residue, and even when it does rain, we can usually get in a day or two or sooner than neighbors can. Mention the Keaton seed firmer or the shaft rebounder. They both pay by getting the seeds to the bottom of the seed V so you get that uniform seeding depth. There's other devices showing up in the market now. Uniform seeding depth is what I'm after. Seed to soil contact, if you're in dry conditions, you'll love it. If you're in wet conditions, it's not near as critical. But what you do is avoid this type of problem. This is in no-till. This has been heavily grazed. They planted off to the side here. These seeds started growing right away. This one was actually up on the side of the seed V laying in dry soil and sat there for a couple weeks until rain came. That's losing yield. That's where the Keaton rebounder or something similar will pay more uniform depth. These are two adjacent stocks in a field that had problems with planter bounce. Again, this one was about two and a half inches deep, nice ear. This is only about an inch and a quarter deep, not near the root system, not near the yield potential. Minimize bounce. I put extra weight in the planter unit. To get uniform seeding depth, I plant deeper. If I do bounce out of the ground, I still got the seed in the ground and still get a good root system. When I say I plant deeper, I've been in, in meetings telling people we plant three and a half inches deep on our corn. Here's a farmer who says, oh, I'm going to run a replicated research to prove you wrong. He normally plants two and a quarter. He went to three. Here's what his yield did across six reps under irrigation. He likes planting deeper. Now, if people say, isn't it colder and wetter down there? I go, so. I say it's more uniform down there. If you're up shallow, going across the field, you're going to have variability in soil temperature and soil moisture. Deeper you go, the more buffered it is, the more uniform your stand will be. We plant deeper. Like say, we're three and a half on our corn now. And again, we leave all the residue in place. Again, this is corn on corn just beside. We get better root system, better standability going deeper. Do some demonstration pots. This is 102 day maturity, 112 day maturity. This is corn on corn. One inch, two inch, three inch. You think I'm afraid of going deeper into heavy residue? I get better nutrient uptake, better water uptake, better yields. Here's the surprising thing, though. This is that same field, corn on corn, under irrigation. Come harvest time, look how little residue is there. You get a lot of farmers say, I can't no-till. I'm going to have a mat of residue this deep. You do if you don't have soil biology. We've got soil biology. I like wheat in the rotation. It's cool season grass. I like I'm looking for a cool season broadleaf. I don't have near as many options that far south. You guys do up here when you got things like peas and other things to look at, the pulses. But again, with wheat rotation, I get opportunities now for more cover crops. I've got more root system out there. I get uh, a different timing of my workload. Here's wheat stubble, already fertilized to plant our corn. Got to look closer. There are five anhydrous knife marks on there. We use anhydrous, cheapest form of nitrogen there is. Five knife marks because I got minimal soil disturbance on our anhydrous applicator. Close on a couple of thoughts from Ralph Dirks. Some of you guys have heard of him before. He's a crop consultant, lives in Paraguay. Down in South America, the cover crops are basically everywhere for erosion control. 
once they learned about the erosion control, then they also started learning about the soil health, soil biology. But they get a lot of rainfall, a lot of slopes, they needed to protect that soil. That's where the name cover came from, from ride some cover. But the thing is, they find out too what it does for soil biology. Again, from Ralph, what long-term no-till soil looks like. Growing that out there. Again, cover crops helps take care of that. Uh, crop rotation helps take care of that. Diversity takes care of that. Cover crops. To me, you can't have too much cover. <laughs> Producer friend of mine, he got out of the tractor to take the picture. That's why it looks a little odd there. He's out in Kansas after wheat harvest, grew a cover crop that all frost killed. A lot of sorghum Sudan in there, but he's got some shorter things in there. Not too many, as you can see now. But again, there's plenty of residue there to help put carbon in the soil. We're harvesting carbon dioxide and sunlight in the off-season to put them in the soil. And I say off-season compared to your cash crops. So again, standing up, he can plant right through that. Now, what if he would have come in there with a the shredder and made a mat and cut it all loose? Oops. Oh. Build the system. Manure, livestock. If you don't have the livestock yourself, have a neighbor that has some manure. Thing is, I hear from a lot of people say you can't spread manure in no-till. I go, why not? Well, the soil gets so slimy, the manure is such big piles, you learn to spread the manure and you do it at an agronomic rate. This is an agronomic rate of beef feedlot manure when it comes to phosphorus. And again, that's what we get regulated on in Nebraska for phosphorus runoff. Too often people are putting on a, what I call a waste rate. It's out there this thick and you're going to have problems, I guarantee you. If you put it on an agronomic rate, it's no problem. You get a spreader that's going to do a uniform distribution of manure as well. Now, if you can bring livestock in yourself, then that's even better yet. A little commercial for Crop Watch, our crop production, crop scouting newsletter out of Nebraska. It's also a portal for all of our extension information on crop production. But attend field days. Look at the soil. Dig soil pits. Look into the soil. Learn about it. The soil pits really open your eyes up. This is on our research farm. We did a soil pit there many years ago for a field day. And this is, according to the soil survey, has less than six inches of topsoil. I look there and it's got a lot more than six inches now. According to the soil survey, the organic matter should be between 2.2 and 2.5 or something like this for this soil to clay loam soil. Intake rate is supposed to be only about two tenths to six tenths inch per hour. You can see with this kind of structure we have built, with this kind of carbon, we're measuring intake rates over four inches per hour. Water soaking in, not running off. We had a researcher out there this summer, this past summer, I should say now. He took a soil sample to characterize where his plots were, and he came back from more laboratories at a 5.2% organic matter. When his soil survey said it's supposed to be 2.2 to 2.4. He said, that's wrong. Took another sample, sent it again to Ray. Came back at 5.3. He was in our corn, bean, wheat rotation with cover crops after the wheat. We are growing carbon back into our soil. That's why we're raising 200 plus corn, where the county average for tea, for insurance purposes, if you don't have your own average, is 119 for dry land, 171 for irrigated. Our yield goes over 200. We're growing healthier soils, growing healthier crops. With that, I even save some time for questions. If you have soil structure, I'm not concerned about the temperature. I've done, I didn't have it in this presentation. I talked to planters, I got it in there. I set the planter for three inches deep, half rate planted, reset it to one inch deep, came back and planted the other half rate. And I couldn't be there daily, but I asked the farm manager to keep track of when they emerged. He says he doubts there's 12 hours difference. But we have good soil structure. The soil temperature at three and soil temperature at one is the same when you have good soil structure. Now, it's also got the same insulating blanket on top. It's got the same everything. It's more buffered. Now, that couldn't tell the difference coming up. A July thunderstorm came through. The three inch planted deep are standing up. The one inch are all leaning. And again, another reason to go deep. The better root system translates to better yield. I tell you guys, I tell every audience, don't go to three and a half. I can guarantee you're not going to be happy. But go out there and plant 
two rounds, half inch deeper than you used to. Flag it, follow it through to yield. I'll be willing to bet next year you're going to plant the entire field half inch deeper, and you're going to have two rounds another half inch deeper. And the guys who've done that, I've got a lot of guys that are down at three inches deep now who used to be an inch and a quarter or second knuckle or whatever rule they used to use. But that better root system will pay. The more buffered, more uniform soil temperature, more soil, uniform soil moisture, you do your more uniform stand, that'll pay. beside it. And that's until we get soil biological life going. Once soil biological life is there, we plant down the old row. And the reason being until soil biological life is there, when you're planting down the old root balls, they'll roll out. And now you got a hole that's you know as big as a root ball. You can't get good seed to soil contact. So activity down there, right the yep. And again, that's where I didn't drive last year. The roots that are there, if it breaks over a hill, water tries to run, those roots will break up the water. The residue that's there will reduce crusting because it's going to absorb the raindrop impact. There are several reasons to plant down the old row. Uh, what about the issue of, of hairpin and shoving residue into the seed slide? Issue in, sorry I didn't repeat the questions earlier. <laughs> you guys may hear them, but on the tape they probably don't hear them. Uh, hairpinning, the question of hairpinning residue, pushing it down in the seed slot. Hairpinning is a function of Planting too shallow for the opener you have. It's as simple as that. If you look at the diameter of a corn planter disc, they are typically 15 inches. Corn planters were developed with the disc openers and corn pine depths were two to three inches deep in tilled soils. A 15 inch diameter running at three inches deep has a good angle to cut residue. Running an inch and a quarter deep will hairpin residue, pushes it down because there's no cutting action to it. Now, White, with their new 9000 series planter just came out, went from a 15 to a 16 inch disc, and they are proud they say they can plant four inches deep now. Industry's even doing this as well. Now, think of a little grass drill. You see native grass is what, three quarter inch deep. Did they have 15 inch openers? No, they had 12 inch openers. Because again, a 12 inch opener running an inch deep has that same residue cutting angle. So again, if you're hairpinning, you're planting too shallow for what your opener is designed for, or your soil is loose, something loosened it. And one of the worst cases I know of is that turbo till or whatever that fluffs that top layer and cuts the residue loose, and now you've got nothing firm to cut. Other questions? No. I'm thinking <laughs> In the row. Yeah. You mentioned the PLFA. Uh, I showed you the my Austrian winter peas, and I said, "Here's my cereal rye, and the corn residue is disappearing." I started that project uh, 2005 as corn bean wheat rotation, where I slip in two extra carbons or two extra legumes. So the base rotation is a what I call two to one carbon to legume with the extra. Carbon's in there, it's a four to one, or the extra legumes in there, it's a two to three. Now you'll say, so? I said, so? My yields are running year to year, there's some differences, but long trend, cover crop pays. But after I went through the cycle, the rotation twice. So this four to one went through twice now, and the two to three went through twice. I pulled PLFA tests across all those so here's my three reps of three treatments, and they were numbered one through nine. I gave them to Joe Clapperton. I told her what the treatments were. I did not tell her which numbers were which. She looked at those nine tests, and she got seven of the nine right. She knew the difference in soil biology by having extra carbon versus extra legume versus having neither. The two she had reversed, but seven out of nine, she could tell the difference in soil biology. I still say so. I'm not sure that corn plant growing there can tell the difference in the biology, at least enough. I don't know. I'm probably at the end of my time. <laughs>